So before we talk about grass-fed cows and crop deaths, we have to talk about trolley problems. I know, I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. So in the most widely known and classic version of the trolley problem, which we'll call switch, you find yourself with a choice. A trolley is hurtling towards five people tied to a train track, and you're standing next to a lever, which you can pull, and divert the train to a different track where only one person is tied down. The question is, what do you do? Pull the lever or do nothing? Now I'm sure many of you are familiar with that version of the trolley problem. Okay, so. What did we learn? But you might be less familiar with the classic twist on the trolley problem we'll call footbridge. In this variation, there is no second track, and you're standing on a footbridge above the trolley. Next to you is a man you can push off the bridge. If you do, he falls in front of the trolley, dying, and slowing down the trolley such that it doesn't hit the five people tied to the track. The question is, what do you do? Push him or do nothing? All right, so remember those answers because they're gonna be important later, I promise. Now, just for a quick refresh, the crop deaths argument basically says because animals die in the production of crops, like when combine harvesters run over mice or we use pesticides on insects, a vegan diet will generally and counterintuitively cause more animal deaths. Now, my first video in this series is a thorough debunking of that claim, but the cliff notes is basically this. Given that the vast majority of animals are fed crops and they don't convert those crop calories efficiently, eating animals not only causes more direct deaths, but actually even more more crop deaths. But I go into like way more detail in the video, so you should still, you know, watch and give it a like. Now the counter to this is that some animals aren't actually eating crops, namely 100% grass-fed cows. And so by extension, not nearly as many accidental and incidental deaths occur in their rearing. In fact, it's pretty common to find people online implying that there's no accidental or incidental deaths in the rearing of grass-fed cows, which is just patently absurd. So there's basically two ways to address this. The first is to just challenge the claim that less deaths occur in the production of grass-fed cows. And the second is to say, even if this is true, there's still good reason to eat a vegan plant-based diet that includes zero cow flesh. And we're gonna start with the latter. So assuming this is true, can those who identify as vegan produce reasons that A, makes them not hypocrites, and B, give solid grounds for abstaining from grass-fed cow flesh? Well, I think yes on both counts, so let's get into it. The first class of reasons I wanna talk about I'm calling the asymmetry of actions. Many vegans and non-vegans alike already don't consider all deaths to be morally equivalent, even when they're brought about by a conscious agent. This is why, for instance, there's about four or five different degrees of homicide written into US law, depending on the state you live in. Even with the same body count, we not only judge those actions differently in an abstract sense, we punish them differently in a very concrete sense. So how are the deaths of grass-fed cows different from the deaths that occur in crop production? Well, to some degree, it depends on who you ask. But common answers in vegan discourse include accidental versus intentional, entailed versus not entailed, and rights violations versus not rights violations. The most common critique vegans hear is about small mammals getting caught in combine harvesters. But these deaths are clearly accidental, as there's no benefit, and even probably a detriment, to having mice chopped up in one's farm equipment. And vegans and non-vegans alike already evaluate accidental and intentional killing very differently. If you intentionally run over someone in your car, most people will judge that very differently than if you'd done so because you lost control of your car. Vegans often also draw a distinction between those deaths which are entailed and those which are not. The death of the cow is entailed. No matter how good our technology gets, we'll still have to harm, exploit, and kill a cow in order to eat their body parts. But the deaths associated with crops could be largely minimized and at least in principle, eliminated altogether. In other words, there's a more inflexible lower bound of death and exploitation that would occur in the grass-fed case compared to the crop case. And then some vegans just don't see crop deaths as rights violations, or they see them as rights violations that would be justified even in the human context. I mean, I've told you before about how I don't think that, you know, defending food supply uh, to prevent starvation is a rights violation. If you ask a human rights activist, like, is it, is it, is it wrong to kill in all scenarios? They're going to say, like, no, there's going to be some times where I think it's OK. And maybe defense is one of them. So it's kind of like in that regard, like how I view the whole like defense killing thing, like defending resources, uh, preventing starvation, etc. A hypothetical that's often used here is to imagine there's a group of humans who continuously come and eat your crops, and it's impossible to communicate or reason with them such that they stop. At this point, they're a survival threat. Since you need food to survive, and so their deaths are either not rights violations or are the types of rights violations that they'd consider permissible. This is in line with a somewhat commonly held view by vegans, and presumably by non-vegans, that our moral obligations change in situations of absolute necessity and survival. The first consideration we have to make is that we can't be perfect. That's the first consideration we have to make. The second consideration is that we have to eat something, not someone, as we'll come on to in just a minute. So we have to eat something to survive. So our survival is predicated on the consumption of food. Now, back in the day when we had to consume animals, 
you could morally justify doing so out of the fact that we needed to to survive. Obviously in the modern day context we don't, which is why this question becomes important. If person A is trying to murder person B and person B kills them in self-defense, most are going to judge those two individuals very differently. And then some vegans just say animal rights should be a logical extension of human rights. But I, I don't follow their definition. Uh, the definition okay. I follow is one um, that I created, which is veganism is a logical extension of human rights. Still, some vegans are primarily concerned with exploitation and the commodity status of animals, in particular how those are inflected through psychological and sociological lenses, as expressed here by David C. Arenas. Using crop deaths as an excuse to keep exploiting animals stems from a misunderstanding of the vegan stance. It's not about pretending to cause no harm, but about stopping our perception of animals as resources or slaves. Veganism is about a collective change of perception, not about body counts. If we can make people truly grasp this, we can avoid all the but vegan also excuses and make people think of the vegan cause as a feasible endeavor instead of an impossibility. Or in this quote from Gary Francione, it's not just a matter of getting people to stop eating slash wearing slash using animals. It's a matter of getting them to see the problems with the entire conceptual framework that perpetuates those behaviors. And of course, this discussion wouldn't be complete without Gary Francione's Gladiator Highway Thought Experiment, where he has us imagine a gladiatorial coliseum where we pay to see unwilling contestants fight to the death for our benefit. He then asks us to imagine we tear down the Colosseum and build a highway. The highway also benefits us and actually on average causes the same number of deaths through traffic accidents. Gary then asks, would we equate the unintended and incidental deaths on the road with the deliberate deaths caused to provide entertainment in the stadium? Would we say that these deaths are all morally equivalent and that we cannot morally distinguish deaths caused in the stadium from deaths caused on the road? Of course not. Now, while all those explanations are fine as far as they go, especially if we're having an outreach conversation on the street, I wanted to see if I couldn't find a more academic and nuanced take in the philosophical literature. I also wanted to find an argument whose origins weren't in veganism, since I think it helps to highlight the fact that, like many things, non-vegans already share many intuitions and values with vegans. And what I found was something called the doctrine of double effect, a moral principle that's been around for centuries. Essentially, the doctrine of double effect holds that a higher standard of justification is required for actions that intend harm rather than merely foresee it. A common example is the way we'd think about a terror bomber who deliberately kills civilians to invoke fear in their enemy, what we'd call direct harmful agency, versus a strategic bomber who targets a military production facility to destroy its machines of war, knowing that there will be some unintended civilian casualties, what we'd call indirect harmful agency. Now in this video, I'm actually gonna talk about a slightly revised version of the DDE, since this more primitive one runs afoul of something called the closeness problem. But if you wanna read about that, check out the links in the description. What I'm going to talk about is Warren Quinn's revised DDE, which originated in this 1989 paper. Quinn's revised DDE distinguishes between three rather than two types of harmful agency, summarized well in the 2019 paper, The Doctrine of Double Effect and Killing Animals for Food. By Quinn's lights, there's indirect harmful agency and then two kinds of direct harmful agency eliminative direct harmful agency and opportunistic direct harmful agency. So what are those? Well, I think it's easiest to demonstrate that by doing a side-by-side -side product comparison. All three of these products have an agent involving a victim in one or multiple ways, and at least one of those involvements leads to the victim being harmed. Both kinds of direct harmful agency also have the stipulation that the involvement which leads to that harm is intended. The difference is that with the eliminative flavor, the presence of the victim is a difficulty to the agent and is seen as such by the agent. Whereas with the opportunistic variety, the presence of the victim is, as the name suggests, an opportunity for the agent and is seen as such. And I know that all sounds complicated, so to make this easier to understand, we're gonna get to examples in a second. But first, why is this even important? Well, because according to Quinn, cases of indirect harmful agency are easier to justify than cases of direct harmful agency. And cases of eliminative direct harmful agency are easier to justify than cases of opportunistic direct harmful agency. In other words, there's a hierarchy of wrongness when comparing types of harmful agency. Now you might be saying, well, no, I don't agree with that. But before we address that, let's explore some of these examples. So in the classic case of carnage, we kill a pig and eat them. Clearly this satisfies A and B. An agent involves a victim and the victim is harmed. Now the involvement of the victim here is also very obviously intended and so condition C is satisfied, making this a type of harmful direct agency. But which type? Well, I'll let Tank and Teal explain. Which form of direct harmful agency is at stake here can be answered by considering whether the presence of the victim poses an opportunity or difficulty for the agent. What exactly constitutes an opportunity or difficulty was not defined by Quinn, and we didn't do so either. The following is a rough, but in our opinion, useful guide for separating the two. If an opportunity for an agent vanishes, that tends to be bad news for the agent. If a difficulty 
functionality vanishes, that tends to be good news for the agent. With that in mind, let us take another look at the example. The presence of the pig is an opportunity for the agent. More precisely, it is an opportunity for making meat out of it. Were the pig to suddenly disappear, that would be bad news for the agent. In typical cases, the agent is aware of this fact as well. Butchers do know that the presence of a pig is an opportunity for making meat out of it. Hence, we can conclude that the action in question is an instance of opportunistic direct harmful agency, because its fourth and final condition is fulfilled. So of the three forms of harmful agency, this is the type we would judge the most harshly. So let's compare that to animals caught in a combine harvester. Again, this clearly satisfies A and B. An agent involves a victim, and the victim is harmed. But in this case, the involvement of the victim isn't intentional. Like we said before, the combine driver isn't swerving to hit the local fauna. Not only is that not a benefit, it's likely a detriment to the driver's goals and farm equipment. Thus, condition C isn't satisfied, and we have an instance of indirect, harmful agency. And of the three forms of harmful agency, this is judged the least harshly. But the more interesting and thorny case is that of pesticides used to kill animals like insects and rodents. As with the combine harvester, this scenario satisfies both A and B. But unlike the combine harvester, the involvement, which leads to the victim being harmed, is intended. Monsanto didn't accidentally spend millions of dollars on R&D to develop an insecticide, and the farmer didn't accidentally spray the insecticide on their crops. Thus, C is satisfied, and so we're working with a type of direct harmful agency. But unlike the killing of the pig, the insects or rodents do not represent an opportunity, but instead a difficulty. Which is to say, if the insects or rodents suddenly vanished, this would be good news for the agent, e.g. the farmer. And so we have an instance of eliminative direct harmful agency, which we should judge more harshly than indirect harmful agency, but less harshly than opportunistic direct harmful agency. Now you may be saying, well, that's all well and good that we can slice and dice deaths and actions in such a nuanced way. But I never signed off on the hierarchy of wrongness outlined by Quinn. But didn't you, at least maybe a little bit? Let's think back to that trolley problem. Some of the parts of the fake people flew into my mouth! Remember Switch and Footbridge? Did you answer differently for those questions? Did one of them give you more pause than the other? Well, as Professor of Philosophy Andy Lamy points out in his book Duty and the Beast, anyone who has taught the trolley problem knows it is common for a large majority of the class, routinely over 90% in my experience, to recommend pulling the lever in the first scenario. In the second scenario, it is more common for a smaller majority to opt not to push the wrestler off the bridge. This pair of responses is inconsistent if consequences are all that matter. After all, in both dilemmas, the choice involves one death or or five. Note that here he describes Footbridge as wrestler in his book. Now you might be noting that if we were to classify Switch using Quinn's revised DDE, Switch would be a case of indirect harmful agency, the type we judge least harshly. As Lamy says, the harm that comes to the person on the side track is not the means by which the agent in either case brings about her goal. In Lever, the five people on the main track would live even if the single person was not on the side track whereas Footbridge would be classified as opportunistic direct harmful agency, the kind we judge the most harshly. The involvement of the victim is intended, and were the victim to disappear, that would be a bad thing for the agent since they couldn't use them to stop the train. So if you said you'd pull the lever but wouldn't push the person off the footbridge, it's possible you already align with Quinn's revised DDE. And if you want to imagine a case of eliminative direct harmful agency here, imagine a trolley is again traveling towards five people. Classic trolley. And you need to pull a switch on a bridge to stop it. But there's a person standing in front of the switch. And the only way to pull the switch in time to stop the train is to knock the person off the bridge, killing them. The person is a difficulty for you here, rather than an opportunity, as in the footbridge case. Now, of course, that might not be the only reason you wouldn't push the person off the bridge. For instance, work by Joshua Green seems to suggest the personal force nature of the pushing seems to make people less likely to choose this option. And the results show that actually what really seems to be doing the work is this personal force stuff. But there's one more trolley problem to consider. I know, I swear to God, this is the last one. And that's the loop scenario. In loop, you again find yourself watching a trolley hurtling towards five people. And again, if you pull the switch, it'll divert the train to another track where it'll hit one person instead. The difference is that the track loops back around to the five people, and the reason diverting it saves them is because hitting the one person slows the trolley down. You can think of it like a blending of the other two scenarios. So we still have a case of opportunistic direct harmful agency, but we've removed the personal force variable. Why is that important? Well, because we have a large survey spanning 42 countries and 70,000 participants who are asked about what decision they'd make in each of these scenarios. The results? 81% of participants endorse sacrificing the one person in the switch scenario, compared to 72% in loop, and just 51% in footbridge. So if the personal force hypothesis was the only thing at play here, we'd expect switch and loop to have the same result, since neither uses personal force and both sacrifice 
sacrifice one person to save five. But that's not what we see. We see that both instances of opportunistic direct harmful agency read as less permissible than the instance of indirect harmful agency. This seems to suggest that only some of the reason for this higher rate of permissibility comes from personal force, while the rest could be explained by something else. And that something else could be the moral intuitions outlined in Quinn's revised DDE. Now why did I say sort of a second ago? Because while there was a difference between switch and loop, the effect size was just 0.1, which is a relatively small effect size. But also note that this pattern of being more willing to pull the switch than push the person holds across many cultures, indicating this is probably something deep in our psychology. In fact, the authors note that this data set reveals a universal pattern of support for the switch loop footbridge spectrum that is suggestive of a common underlying cognitive structure. Also, just to give you a taste of how complex this might get, here's Joshua Green talking about some of the paradoxical research in this area. One possibility of what's really going on here is, is something that Mark alluded to earlier. This is this is a paper done with Mark and Fiery Cushman, that what really matters here is body contact. And if that's right, then we can we can look at a third intermediary case. So here in this case, which we'll call the footbridge switch case, you are dropping the guy through a trap door, but you're right next to him. So you're not physically far away. Uh, so you just go and he goes down. So here it's, is it about spatial distance? this comparison, or is it about contact? And consistent with, with, with Mark's uh, r result, it seems to be more about contact. It's not about it being far away. It's about whether you're touching the person or whether or not you're hitting the switch. But there's another wrinkle, which Mark alluded to earlier. Even here, there are two differences. Here, when you're using the switch, not only are you not touching the person, you're also not doing something a little more subtle. You're not using your muscle force to directly impact the person. And if we want to get at that variable, we can use a case which I'll call the footbridge pole case, where now you're pushing the guy with a pole you're not touching him, but you're using your muscles to directly impact the person. And the results show that actually what really seems to be doing the work is this personal force stuff. Now, another important factor that people have been talking about for as long as people have been playing around with trolley cases is the distinction between means and a side effect. So in this case here, uh, our friend Joe needs to divert the trolley by getting across this footbridge to the switch. But unfortunately, there's somebody on the switch. And on the way to the switch, he is going to, as a side effect, byproduct, collateral damage, knock this person off the bridge and to his death. Um, now, what's interesting about this case is that you got all the personal force in the world. This is not hitting a switch from far away, your body directly impacting the person. Um, and yet here, people say that this is, mostly say that this is okay. And what this tells us is that the effect of personal force depends on this other factor. So there's an interaction between this personal force factor and this factor of what sometimes I think misleadingly called intention, but harming somebody as a means versus harming somebody as a side effect. Um, in fact, this is, this is not statistically different from the good old switch case where you're far away and it's a side effect and everything else. Interestingly, if you just tweak this case a little bit so that as the guy's running across, he has to bump, push the guy out of the way, the acceptability of that action goes way down. Something about having a specific targeted body movement towards moving the person uh, in a way that's going to harm him uh, seems to have a big effect. So again, this, 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 it, it, it seems to be about these factors in interaction. And even if you don't find the trolley cases convincing, think back to the terror and strategic bomber. Did you see any moral difference between those two scenarios when the personal force variable is absent or equalized? Now look, maybe you aren't particularly deontic in nature and lean more towards consequentialist reason. That's fine because the rest of the reasons are going to lean in that direction. But either way, having familiarity with arguments from both perspectives is going to benefit your understanding. And if you're a vegan activist, probably your activism. Because in these trolley problems, if we take sacrifice the one to generally be more indicative of consequentialism and don't sacrifice the one to be more indicative of deontology or virtue ethics, then we can see people have a broad range of normative beliefs. And it's pretty hard to shift someone's underlying normative ethical framework. So if you can make a convincing case in their own framework, all the better. Also, I just want to flag that I don't necessarily personally endorse all the arguments in this video, because in this video, I'm trying to do two things. One, show why a particular vegan isn't necessarily a hypocrite for not eating grass-fed cows, even if it would cause less deaths. And two, present cases that could be persuasive to a broad swath of normative beliefs. Charges of hypocrisy are usually going to hinge on what the individual believes and their particular normative framework, not whether you find their framework convincing. If there's a Christian who thinks that homosexuality is a sin, and that Christian also hooks up with people of the same sex, they're being a hypocrite. He was asked to talk to Goodman in May of 2016 about rumors the married Goodman was gay and lying about his sexuality. Goodman is a staunch conservative and an adversary to the LGBTQ community. But that hypocrisy is independent of whether you personally think homosexuality is a sin. For instance, I don't, so I wouldn't think that they're doing anything inherently wrong. 
but I would think they're being a hypocrite. Likewise, the doctrine of double effect might not personally resonate with you, but that's irrelevant to a charge of hypocrisy so long as the vegan in question sincerely holds that belief. All right, intermission over. What are these other reasons? Well, first let's talk about what I'm calling the local maximum issue. The eating grass-fed cow strategy might risk finding ourselves on what I'd call a local maximum. Even if it is the case that there's less incidental deaths in grass-fed cows, no matter what, at the very least, we still have to kill all those cows. So regardless of innovation, our floor is still the deaths of all those cows. Whereas in the crop scenario, with enough innovation, we could take those deaths down to zero or near zero. But if we push society towards eating grass-fed cows, we'll create a valley of friction, both psychological and structural, for then giving that up in the future. When instead we could start moving away from it right now, and more aggressively pour resources into developing crop death reduction technology and things like veganic farming that reduce both direct deaths and crop deaths. And we'll dive into those specific innovations in more detail in the longer video I'm doing with Vegan Gaze and Chris Hines. Think of it like this. You wanna move out of your small town for opportunities in the big city. The best city for you is Chicago, but Seattle isn't too bad. And you can make the move there now rather than waiting a few months to go to Chicago. So you do. And it turns out Seattle is better than your small town. So you start laying down roots, making friends, furnishing your apartment, etc., with a plan that you want to move to Chicago one day. But that day never comes. Every time you consider it, you think how hard it'll be to leave your new friends or what a pain it'll be to move your furniture across the country or how there'll be a learning curve for Midwest culture. Hey, they said they were going to the Twin Cities. Oh well, yeah? Yeah, yeah, is that useful to you? Oh, you betcha, yeah. Yeah. And you will have found yourself stuck on a local maximum. Or here's another example. Children with abusive parents may develop unhealthy coping mechanisms for dealing with the trauma. Those coping mechanisms protect them in the moment, and in some sense, in the short term, they're better than not having them. But there's usually healthier ways of dealing with those emotions. They just often take more time to cultivate. And once you've got an established trauma response, it's harder to develop a healthier habit than if you'd never developed the response in the first place. Imagine Mike, a 30-year-old Netflix binging alcoholic who turned to drinking in his teens to numb himself to the reality of living with an abusive father. He's still got demons from back then, but every time he throws on Bridgerton and has a margarita, he feels a little bit better. Now we know if he dropped the drinking, sought therapy, and started an exercise program, his physical and mental health would probably be better than they are now. In other words, they would be at an overall higher maximum. The problem is, in addition to starting two new habits, he'd also have to break two addictive old ones. In this transition period, he'd likely feel worse, and there'd be a ton of physical and mental friction standing in the way of his changes. So however hard it is to start therapy and exercise for the average person, it's even harder for Mike because he's got to break away from these unhealthy entrenched habits. In other words, his entrenched local maximum. In the same way, this eat grass-fed cow strategy might leave us with the behavioral friction of escaping the habitual and addictive nature of eating animal flesh, the mental friction of not seeing animals as mere commodities, the logistical friction of moneyed interest and their attendant lobbyists and disinformation campaigns to maintain the new grass-fed status quo, and on and on. And then of course we've got the environmental issue. Grass-fed cows aren't great for climate change, and climate change is currently killing and will continue to kill humans and animals. Climate change will increase the chance and or severity of wildfires, heat waves, flooding, droughts, hurricanes, ocean acidification, etc. Do we think a massive wildfire like this kills very many animals? And not only will all those things cause excess deaths. Between 2000 and 2019, South Asia saw over 110,000 heat-related excess deaths a year. They'll make life increasingly difficult and miserable for those of us who are still alive, particularly the most marginalized among us who have the least ability to marshal defenses against these changes. Food shortages, water shortages, migrant crises, increased international conflict, worse air quality will generally be not super chill, to say the least. All right, but I thought grass-fed cows were supposed to be better for the environment. Well, without going too deep, this visual does a pretty good job of debunking that. What this basically shows is that even the least impactful beef is still worse in terms of GHG emissions than just the average emissions for nuts, peas, beans, and tofu. And if we look here, we see even the best beef produces many times more GHG emissions than even just average peas on a per gram of protein basis. And that's not even considering the truly fair comparison of grading it against the least impactful nuts, beans, peas, and tofu, many of which are actually carbon negative. Also, you might be wondering what these weird curves are. Well, the height of the curve represents the amount of production globally with that specific footprint. So we can see even when we compare the good beef, the height is very low. That means hardly any production actually has that footprint. Whereas when we look at the averages of the plant-based sources, the curve is quite high, meaning a large percentage have that footprint. 
And when we look at nuts, a ton of the production is carbon negative, not just a little bit. So it's not just that the low end of cow flesh is worse than even the average of plant sources. And it's not just that the low end of plant sources is way lower than the low end of cow flesh. It's that the low end of cow flesh, which still isn't great, is also extremely rare. Whereas the low end of nuts is not rare at all, nor are the average values for tofu, beans, and peas. What this means practically is that if I pick up nuts at the grocery store, there's gonna be a very good chance they're carbon negative. If I pick up cow flesh, there's very little chance it's going to be this good cow flesh. And grass-fed cows actually offer some unique disadvantages, but I'll let ecologist Nicholas Carter explain. And does the methane, does it differ based on if they're corn grain fed versus grass fed? Yeah, I mean, that's what makes it even more deceiving is typically if they're grass fed, they'll emit more methane. Why is and that? There's two reasons for this. Uh, one is when you're feeding cows grass, it's gonna take them longer to get to slaughter weight. So they're living slightly longer. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna mean a bit more methane in that case. But also, you know, their native vegetation to eat would be like grass, but it's still a bit more fibrous. So the more fibrous diet will make them belch a bit more. A lot of the initial claims around methane being biogenic and methane not mattering when it comes from uh, animals and when it comes from uh, from in particular uh, cattle and, and dairy herd, that originates from Jason Roundtree's study, which was then picked up from Sacred Cow and this documentary and book, and they just run with it. And they mm -hmm. say, methane from cows doesn't matter, but we're seeing it from space. We're, we're observing that it does matter and we're seeing that signature in space. And then this paired with the different reports that are out saying 32% of all methane comes from cattle. So if That's we huge. if we reduce this quickly, we're going to see atmospheric effects quickly because it only lasts in the atmosphere about for about ten years. You are probably using more land. You're going to produce less uh, milk, and as using more land, you're going to displace more biodiversity, likely, or prevent rewilding of some sense. And when when cows eat more grass, I think it's very important to understand too. The the more fibrous diet the cows eat, the more methane is produced. Um, there's been some studies that showed as much as four times as much methane is produced with grass finished uh, beef or uh, more pasture for dairy versus the alternative. So this is not the way to go in that sense. So in that sense, it's, it's a lot worse. So soy milk would be a better option from an environmental perspective than the most regener regeneratively produced, most biodynamic, most organic, local farm next door dairy milk by far not even close there you go also contrary to what many people believe every vegan doesn't care about non-human animal deaths to the total exclusion of absolutely everything else in the same way that many non-vegans don't care about human deaths to the total exclusion of absolutely everything else. Not yes. Don't care also. about the little guy. Remember, most vegans and non-vegans alike still drive cars despite knowing there will be thousands of traffic fatalities every year. If eating crops compared to eating grass-fed cows caused 1 million and 1 more incidental fly deaths, but spared 1 million humans and massively mitigated all those other things I just talked about, most vegans aren't going to opt for the grass-fed cow just because more non-human animals would die. And that's not even considering the results of tipping points that could occur via climate change. Tipping points are basically sudden and or large changes that occur in a climate system and which are often irreversible. Once something like this happens, we're not talking about a little more death and hardship. We're talking about massive changes and crucially massive changes that can't just be reversed by reducing GHG emissions after the fact. But the whole animal ag climate change topic really deserves its own video. I just wanted to note that this is something that decidedly cannot be absent from our moral considerations involving humans and non-human animals. All right, so let's get more contentious. This group of reasons I'm calling the asymmetry of victims. So remember what I said earlier, I don't myself necessarily hold all the positions presented here. All right, so imagine we've got two farming methods for growing lentils. Using the first method, one house fly will die a year. Using the second, one pig will die a year. Do you have a preference as to which farming method is used? My guess would be that most people do. So let's go through some reasons why they might. Also, the reason I'm using this example is because it's often implied that a large number of these crop deaths are insect deaths from pesticides, which apparently aren't used in grass-fed agriculture culture, but that's for a future video. All right, reason one, lifespan. A typical housefly lives 50 to 30 days, whereas a pig can live 15 to 20 years. If you think there's moral relevance to the amount of life you rob from someone, then this is going to factor into your decision. And if you want to test if this is something you care about, imagine someone killing a 15-year-old human versus a 95-year-old human. Does one of these seem worse or do they feel the same? Two, chance of sentience. 
Let's say the pig and fly had the same amount of life to live. Is there anything else that would tip us towards one method or the other? Well, chance of sentience seems like another potential candidate. If I think there's a 99% chance that pigs are sentient, but only a 50% chance that flies are sentient, then it seems to make sense to prefer the method that kills the fly, since the method has a higher probability of not actually hurting someone. 3. Depth of experience. Now I know this is the most contentious, but we'll go over it anyway since it is something that comes up. You might think it's reasonable to conclude that given the vast difference in the size and complexity of different nervous systems, that some individuals have experiences that are deeper or more pronounced than others. You might also think that makes those experiences more morally relevant. If you do, this is going to be yet another factor in favor of choosing one method over another. Note, to actually investigate this question with the appropriate amount of rigor would take a much longer video. I'm just flagging it as a concern I sometimes hear. Also note that the point of these considerations is not to say it's okay to kill flies. It's to give a tool for comparing and evaluating situations in which individuals will die no matter what. All right, and the final reason for today is that this strategy is not scalable. Even when we imagine incredibly idealized and impossible scenarios, as they did in the 2017 report entitled Grazed and Confused, where we literally convert all grassland to accommodate grazing cows and assume some of the highest productivity imaginable, this would still only supply us with about a thousand daily calories per person on Earth, not even half the amount of calories we need. In fact, only about a third of our average daily requirements, assuming some food losses and waste. Not to mention, as they note, this would be logistically unfeasible. Plus, as already noted, pretty terrible for the environment. And of course, we're also not factoring in all the health-related externalities of eating that much meat and cheese. All right, you say, but even if it's not fully scalable, there's some amount of grass-fed cows that can be sustained with more realistic estimations. And so we should find that amount and just eat them since it'll cause less deaths. Well, using the Grazed and Confused report, let's see what that would look like with more realistic figures. If we used all grasslands on Earth to raise grass-fed ruminants and employed more reasonable estimations, we could extract between 7 to 18 daily grams of animal protein per person on Earth. So first, is this sustainable? Well, as we just talked about, converting all those grasslands is gonna be a net negative from a climate change and environmental perspective. And unless you've been living under a rock, climate change is kind of a big deal. But let's say it wasn't. Then vegans would have to start eating seven grams of grass-fed cows and milk a day, right? Well, still no. The report also states that the average daily supply of animal protein in wealthy nations is 50 to 60 grams per person. And if we check out Our World in Data, they report an overall world average protein supply of 33 grams per person per day. So why is that important? Because it means that in a wealthy nation, a person would have to reduce their animal protein intake to anywhere from a third to a ninth of what it is now. So. Let's take the low-end estimate of 7 grams of animal protein per day and the current low-end average of 50 grams of protein per day for wealthy regions, since I imagine most of my viewers are from wealthy regions, and then see what this would mean. This would mean people need to reduce their intake to about one-seventh of what it is now. Basically, whatever amount they currently eat on Monday, they'd have to spread over the entire week. It's kind of like a reverse meatless Monday. So knowing people, how well do you think that's going to go? This is the equivalent to one glass of milk a day, or one extra large egg a day, or one sixteenth of a pound of ground cow per day. I mean, everyone's doing Meatless Mondays already, right? Oh wait, they're not? In fact, there's people who eat nothing but animals and secretions? Primal, I'm going to attempt to eat my body weight and testicles today. You can track my progress on the testicle ticker below, and it starts right now. So if I had to guess, I guess there's gonna be some resistance to most people cutting back like that. And so I was like, right, plants try and kill me, I'm not gonna buy anything with a plant. In other words, we're gonna be well over our allotted seven grams per day. So it doesn't make sense for vegans to add to that number when they're already willing and happy to avoid eating animals. Think of it like this. If you've got one person who's eating 21 grams per day, already half of what we eat in rich countries, you need at least two vegans eating no animal protein at all to bring that average back down to our desired seven grams per day. Or let's ratchet it up. For every stubborn person who would wanna continue eating high amounts of animal protein, let's say 70 grams per day, you'd need nine vegans eating none. And I'm sure many carnivore dieters are gonna continue to eat way more than that. Also, I know some of you are gonna be saying, hey, that says protein supply, not protein consumption. And yes, that is true. Calorie and protein supply don't track consumption exactly. Instead, calorie supply measures the amount of calories available for consumption at the final stage of the supply chain, the retail or distribution level. This means actual consumption of calories will be calorie supply minus any consumer waste that occurs after retail. Actual consumption is therefore lower than calorie supply. But both the seven grams and the 50 grams are measured here in protein supply. 
not consumption. And so we're just assuming the waste that occurs would be roughly proportional. Now knowing the goal is to eventually eliminate animal farming altogether in favor of low crop death farming methods like vertical and veganic farming, why the f would we do this? Think of all the time, money, resources, and public messaging that would have to go into this. All the grasslands that would have to be destroyed and later rewilded. All the very confusing messaging around how we're continuing to kill cows because gee golly, we sure do just have the animal's best interest at heart. What the hell are you talking about? All to turn around and tear it all down because there's actually better options that don't even look to be that far off. And remember, it's not just that we would spend all that time and all those resources crafting this monument to cognitive dissonance. It's that this would be time and effort and innovative capacity not directed at more ethical crop growing methods. And this is in the rosiest of scenarios from the grass-fed rhetorical perspective. So even if we grant the more animals killed in crop production argument, we've still got myriad reasons for not purchasing grass-fed cows. The asymmetry of actions, which includes things like intent, entailment, what constitutes a rights violation, the psychology and sociology of viewing animals as commodities, and the doctrine of double effect. We've also got the problem of local maximums, the environmental considerations, the issues with scalability, and the asymmetry of the victims. And remember, all this explanation for a product that makes up an incredibly small percent of the animals that people actually eat in the real world. But let's look at an example in the human context that consolidates all these long-winded explanations into a more singular, cohesive, moral intuition. You're living in 1800s America, and you don't think chattel slavery is, like, super cool. And you think it should end. An abolitionist, if you will. And part, part of the reason you want it to end is because of the direct harm that comes to the enslaved individuals. You tell all your friends why you think it should end, and even go around making public displays to government officials and the general population. Then you find yourself at your local grocer, and they've got corn grown by free individuals, corn grown by enslaved individuals, and corn grown by happy enslaved individuals. And yes, if you're unfamiliar, the happy slave myth was a real thing. And here's a few examples. If you're interested in checking them out, just pause the video. Plus, there's some links in the description. All right, back to it. Now, the amount of direct abuse from the slave masters, as well as the incidental deaths and injury that occurs in field work, is much worse for the slave corn than the free corn. But you find out that while the happy slave corn has more direct abuse compared to the free corn, the free corn actually has more incidental harm and death. You also know this so-called happy slave corn is not scalable and uses far more resources. So the question is, should you buy, advocate, endorse the so-called happy slave corn as an abolitionist? Obviously not. Or at least I think most people would say obviously not. I think most people are gonna say we should abolish all the slavery while working to improve the safety profile of farming corn in general. In the same way that vegans would say we should abolish animal slavery while working to improve our farming methods in general. Now this clearly isn't a perfect analogy, but I think it's close enough to illustrate some of the prima facie absurdity contained in vegans should eat grass-fed cows or their hypocrites position. Also, even if it doesn't, that's like what the rest of this long video was for. And just remember, these are all arguments that apply even if we grant that grass-fed causes more death or harm or whatever is being claimed, which I'm definitely not leaving uncontested. But that'll be for part two of this video, or I guess part three if you're counting that previous crop deaths video I did as part one. And if you wanna help me make this my full-time career, check out the Patreon in the description. And shout out to Ryan O'Neill, Tom Eisenbeis, Nutbase News, Monstar, David Yastrzemski, and Maxwell Edison.